The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night shows knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their lying is gone out through all the earth, their words to the end of the world. In them had he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, rejoice as a strong man to run the race. His going forth is from the end of heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hidden from the heat thereof. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making the wise simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord is true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than go, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servants warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from the secret faults. Keep back your servants also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Moses describes in this way the righteousness that is by the law. The man who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down. Or, Who will descend into the deep? That is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the word of faith we are proclaiming, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all, and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How, then, can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all of the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly till the end the confidence we had at first.
Moses describes in this way the righteousness that is by the law. The man who does these things will live by them. In the passage from Romans, Paul reflects on the nature of righteousness and salvation, through which we become and maintain ourselves as devoted disciples of Christ. Although Paul addresses his letter to the church in Rome, most of whom were Gentiles, this passage lives in a section of Romans in which Paul is concerned with the salvation of the Jews. Indeed, chapter 10, believe, uh, chapter 10 begins, Brothers, my heart's desire for the Israelites is that they may be saved. And so Paul begins by discussing the Old Testament concept of righteousness, with which the Jews would have been intimately familiar. This kind of righteousness comes from following the Old Testament law, an elaborate set of rules, rites, sacrifices, and dietary restrictions. This righteousness through the law was based on an outward display of good works. It is easy to see how adherence to these rules, and hence righteousness, could turn into a box-ticking exercise, removing God from the activity, or a competition who could offer the largest or the best sacrifice, for instance. It is also easy to see how this could turn believers against each other. If righteousness is based on an outward display of good works, then your neighbor could identify times when you had fallen short. Did you offer the correct sacrifice? Did you follow all the dietary restrictions or practice all of the rituals required to be considered clean? Righteousness through the law through works is complicated. It's open to misinterpretation, and it can turn discipleship into a competition. The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. Paul contrasts the Jewish concept of righteousness by the law with righteousness by faith, which in verse 3 we read is that righteousness that comes from God. It is through this righteousness that we can commit ourselves to be Christ's disciples. There are three key differences between righteousness by the law and righteousness by faith. First, where righteousness by the law is based on human effort, righteousness by faith is based on Christ's sacrifice. Where righteousness by the law is complicated, righteousness by faith is straightforward. Where righteousness by the law can turn believers against each other, righteousness by faith requires that we support each other. Let's start with the first difference. Righteousness by the law is based on human effort. It's based on our ability to fulfill the many obligations that the Old Testament places on believers. It restricts righteousness and thus discipleship to those with the ability and the capacity to follow the rules. Think financial ability or physical ability. Righteousness by faith is based on Christ's sacrifice, which makes righteousness and hence discipleship and salvation available to everyone. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus says that he came to fulfill or complete the law. He completes its demands so that everyone can achieve righteousness by faith in Christ. That doesn't mean we get to do what we please, for as we shall see, discipleship requires commitment and dedication. So let's move to the second difference. Righteousness by the law is complicated, involving those rites, rituals, and restrictions that required so much effort and energy in the Old Testament. Righteousness by faith is straightforward, though that doesn't mean it is simple. At the core of this righteousness is the word, as Paul says, the word of faith that we are proclaiming. Paul is clear that this word comes first. It is not just a requirement for discipleship. It is a prerequisite, something that comes before. We must hear the word to believe. We must hear the word to bring out a desire in us for discipleship and holiness. What word have we heard? What word have you heard? I expect if I asked each of you to speak that word of faith, that word of faith that we are proclaiming, I wouldn't get exactly the same answers from everyone. 
I'm sure the answers would be similar, but they would be shaped by our experiences. The person or people who introduced us to faith, the people and experiences that shaped our faiths through our lives. More about these people in a bit. The message is the same, but the word comes in as many varieties and flavors and colors as there are disciples. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Once we have received the word, righteousness requires a continual commitment to keeping that word alive in our mouths and in our hearts. Paul is deliberate about his choice of body parts here. We must confess with our mouths, with our spoken words, not just with our thoughts. Confessing Christ with your mouth means being vocal, open, public about your faith and discipleship. Likewise, we must believe in the resurrection in our hearts, not just in our heads. Believing in your hearts means believing not just in the facts of the resurrection, but believing and responding to the resurrection with your entire soul. The word believe in verse 9 of that passage can also be translated as trust or have confidence in. If I say, believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, you can believe it as a fact. It might not change your life. You can believe it. If I say, trust that God raised Jesus from the dead, what difference does that make? To trust in God, not just believe. That difference is at the heart of discipleship. The connection between the mouth and the heart is critical here. The same word, the same faith, the same righteousness lives and thrives in both. That means your head and your heart must be in sync. It does you no good to confess with your mouth if you don't trust with your heart. Jesus says in Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Christ commands us to practice what we preach, and indeed to preach what we practice. We must devote our entire being to the cause of discipleship, not just a part of ourselves. How then can they believe in the one they have not heard? Let's move to the third and final difference between those two kinds of righteousness. Righteousness by the law can turn believers against each other, making faith a competition. Righteousness by faith re relies on hearing the word and confessing the word. By extension, that righteousness requires us to spread the gospel message. Paul spells it out clearly. We are sent to preach. We preach for others to hear, others hear to believe. God uses his disciples to speak the word that empowers our desire for and our commitment to discipleship. Each of us heard the word from someone else. We are thus in debt to speak the word to others. Likewise, the passage from Hebrews emphasizes support for each other. Encourage one another daily so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We must support one another in discipleship. By removing the barriers to righteousness, by completing the law, Christ brought salvation to everyone equally, regardless of capacity or ability. To build God's kingdom requires cooperation, support, and evangelism, not competition. Christ's sacrifice makes discipleship accessible so that all can share equally and fully in his salvation. The word of faith that was proclaimed to us is a powerful word. It powers a desire for discipleship in all who hear it. Walking the path of discipleship requires a trust in God's saving power and a commitment to spread the word to others. We must ensure that our mouths continue to proclaim God's word and that our lives reflect our trust in that word. It is a straightforward task, but not an easy one. 
which is why we must give, to, uh, give strength to and receive strength from our fellow disciples throughout our lives. Amen. God, our Redeemer, who called your church to witness that you were in Christ, reconciling the world to yourself, help us to proclaim the good news of your love, that all who hear it may be reconciled to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.